Good morning everybody and welcome to the second week of our Summer Academy. After the very intensive and extensive lectures, discussions and visits on the role of participation and empowerment based on sociological, educational, psychological and political perceptions in heritage studies, this week we will see whether and how empowerment can be achieved via communication sciences and economy on the one hand and planning sciences on the other hand. Today we start with the perception of participation and empowerment in heritage studies in relation to entrepreneurship and mediation. As I have presented in my welcome speech, heritage studies have to consider and or to develop approaches which on the one hand follow the idea and the message provided by the different heritage conventions, but on the other hand heritage studies urgently need to develop concepts for a sustainable use of heritage. Sustainability in general was discussed in our last year's academy. In this year's summer academy we are exploring sustainabilities related to human behavior. How can humans be empowered, encouraged or trained to protect their heritage? How can we link sustainable protection strategies with the diversity of the use of heritage ranging from tourism via educational use to creative industries, for example. Heritage has become a label and a commodity and therefore it is important to consider those information processes within innovative concepts of use. Innovative concepts of use have to include concepts of economy and mediation, as I have mentioned before. The idea is to integrate concepts of sustainability with ideas of communication and mediation with economic interests. Or, in other words, we need to find strategies for combining approaches of heritage protection with human development and economy. One of the most innovative concepts of economy, which shall be implemented in heritage studies, is that one of entrepreneurship. One of the most famous entrepreneurs is Professor Günther Faltin. Günther Faltin is Professor for Entrepreneurship at the Free University of Berlin, where he has established the field of entrepreneurship. In 1985, he has established the Projektwerkstatt with, I have to say that in German because it's a German term, with the idea of the tea campaign as a model of entrepreneurship. The company has become the world's largest importer of Darjeeling tea. He is initiator and sponsor of the reforestation project of the World Wide Fund for Nature in Darjeeling, India. Professor Faltin has carried out several visiting professorships in Asia, conducted, conducted, sorry, conducted scientific lecture series and workshops in more than 20 countries, such as Canada, US, Mexico, Brazil, Japan, South Korea, Thailand and India. As expert of the project Entrepreneurship in Education and Training in Russia and Ukraine of the European Training Education, an institution of the EU. He gave workshops in St. Petersburg and Kiev. In 2001, he founded together with Professor Dietrich Winterhagen the Stiftung Foundation Entrepreneurship with the goal to promote a more open culture of enterprising. Günther Faltin initiated the Laboratory for Entrepreneurship and is the business angel of several successful start-ups. In 2009 he was awarded the German Founders Award for his tea campaign. In 2010 the federal president of Germany honored him 
as pioneer of entrepreneurship, thinking in Germany, by giving him the cross of the order of merit. The start-up project of his career was the tea campaign, as I have already mentioned. Meanwhile, is, uh, it is a flagship for successful entrepreneurship. The idea was to import the Jiling tea directly from the farmers and to create a win-win situation for both producers and users. Therefore, he identified the tea farmers in the region and invited them to sell their products directly to the campaign. With this strategy, he achieved to exclude the intermediary distributors and thus he could sell the products for a cheaper price compared to the normal business procedure with a variety of stakeholders involved. Actually, not only could he sell the product cheaper, but also the farmers got a better price for their products. He furthermore created a cheap system of sales by using the internet as sales channel, selling only bulk packages. His approach is to teach us that simplifying business helps to reduce costs and that creativity is needed to be successful, a successful entrepreneur. Entrepreneurship, according to Professor Faltin, is a dynamic process in which existing models of business are newly and creatively arranged and rearranged and transformed into innovative strategies. The approach of entrepreneurship promoted by Professor Faltin can best be read in his book Brain vs. Capital, which has become a bestseller in many countries in the world. In this book, entrepreneurship is identified as an economic model which anticipates the challenges and chances offered by the market, takes them up for use and implements them for profit seeking. This includes a coordinated use of resources and the ability to accept possible risks. Entrepreneurship is therefore implemented in three steps. In the identification of the potentials of the market, the creative development of business ideas and the implementation of these ideas. Let's hear Professor Faltin's suggestions about the idea of empowering heritage stakeholders for sustainable economic use via entrepreneurship. Günther, uh, you know that we are running a very interesting course in Cottbus about heritage uh, studies, around heritage studies. And uh, we are running for the third year summer academy and the topic of this summer academy is a topic which is very much discussed uh, in UNESCO. It is a question of sustainability, of empowerment and participation. And uh, you know that UNESCO is uh, really interesting in valorization of culture uh, and but, but uh, uh, considering these three elements. So my question is, my first question is, uh, so do you, see, do you see a possibility how entrepreneurship uh, could be used uh, enriching, enriching uh, uh, UNESCO's policy, mainly under the topic participation, the topics participation, empowerment and sustainability? Uh, let me give an example. Uh, rainforest. Uh, to avoid that the trees are being cut, you have to give them a value, yes. a higher value than the value it has after it is cut. So use of the rainforest must be conceptualized in a way that it makes sense and it has also some economic value in it. Mm -hmm. So if I try to transfer this idea to your subject of how to deal with cultural heritage. The question is, can we make use of it that it helps avoid destruction? And how can that use look like? This is precisely the idea behind, uh, behind the concept of valorization. But you know, UNESCO is dealing with that issue for a couple of years, but they have not 
found, not yet found, a way of how this can be done. It is a, an idea of valorization, but the question is, is there anything which can be done, uh, which can be done in terms of change the economic uh, structure and the economic way behind it, you know, change the normal economic uh, procedure? Yeah. Uh, uh, if we put entrepreneurship into play, it's about uh, how to create a business model yes. that is a win-win situation mm -hmm. for the one who is the producer, for the one who is going to buy the product or the service, that everybody feels satisfied. Yes, yes. And in terms of participation, you know, do you think that, for example, the, the local population has to be included in that model or not? And if, how this can be done? Do you have an idea? I know nobody has a solution for that, uh, for that issue and they are discussing and discussing and it is for the first time that uh, I try to, to discuss this issue with someone with your background because you know we come from, from, from the field of political sciences of, of whatever and I think it is very important to listen to someone who has created like you so many very, very innovative projects on that issue. Uh, participation is a very important issue. Uh, if you if the people feel left out from the business, particularly mm -hmm. from the business, they will resent it and That's they it. will sabotage it. Yep. So participation not only is a politically a very valuable issue, but it's also so economically. Um, how to involve people actually with their own business, uh, be it the tours, tour guidance, mm -hmm. food, mm -hmm. uh, accommodation. You know, we discussed the issue of participation. In your former projects, did you have a similar, a similar demand or uh, challenge in, in including locals into, uh, into the entrepreneurship or into the business based on entrepreneurship? We did something like that in Chiang Mai, in Northern Thailand, many mm -hmm. years ago. Uh, the so-called experts recommended that, the, or they analyzed, or they came to the conclusion that people come there to go to the market and buy all these uh, Louis Vuitton and uh, famous brands. And uh, I'm not an expert in this. I'm an, maybe somebody who has some experience in entrepreneurship but not in this kind of tourism. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering uh, whether uh, tourists really come to such a place like Northern Thailand to buy all the things that they get everywhere. In, in every big town they, uh, they get uh, these uh, famous brands and mm -hmm. they may get it a little bit cheaper or they get fakes somewhere in uh, Northern Thailand. But I, I was really questioning whether this is the main point mm -hmm. uh, that attracts tourists. Mm -hmm. So what I recommended was why not uh, pick up local cultural issues and uh, put it to work in a way that it is uh, accessible yeah. to tourists. Yeah. And uh, as we were independent, uh, we just started it. Mm -hmm. And we found that there were some excavations of interesting pottery pieces with fantasy animals mm -hmm. uh, that is available nowhere else. Mm -hmm. So we did it and it worked well. Mm -hmm. It worked particularly well with uh, Japanese tourists. You always have to go for the proof of concept. You may have great ideas, but better go for the proof of concept. So it worked very well with Japanese uh, uh, tourists. And we even, uh, that lady that picked up the idea and, and uh, had put it into a business, uh, she started to export it to uh, Japan successfully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, uh, we should not just ask what is working with tourists, but what could work with tourists in a way that we provide new ideas, we provide a new point of views and we try out, particularly we try out something. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, tourism is, for my understanding, is a bit uh, very mainstreamed and uh, not really a very creative field. Mm -hmm. 
In terms of the interest of the locals, you know, because this is uh, uh, this is what 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 we, we all or what we are discussing at the moment. Um, do you think that it would be or that they could be encouraged to create more if they are paid with normal on on the normal uh, let me say economic exchange, or do they want other benefits? I think uh, in participation there are several uh, advantages. Mm -hmm. One is you create more ideas, you have more points of view and you uh, create more and better ideas. It's a kind of what you could call crowdsourcing. It's always an advantage. Those people who have worked in that field for a long time, they are some kind blindfolded. They are, uh, yeah, this is a, a normal phenomen phenomenon and uh, get, get them into, uh, uh, into an exchange of ideas. Uh, secondly, of course, uh, they go for their economic uh, benefit, which is not that bad. Uh, the question is, can you create a kind of business model? I call it a, I use a German term, Gesamtkunstwerk, mm -hmm. uh, meaning you have to put it on several legs you have to uh, 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 take account of uh, several issues like not only economics but ecological issues, of course cultural issues as a main topic and a few other issues mm -hmm. and create something that fits and creates win-win situations and at the same time creates economic benefits for all those who have uh, are stakeholders in such a project. Mm -hmm. The World Heritage uh, background in UNESCO is the most famous one. We have nearly nearly thousand sites inscribed on the World Heritage list, and um, from my point of view, the idea of uh, inscribing World Heritage is is a commercialization uh, of the of the idea to, of, of protecting World Heritage as such. Commercialization is uh, an I think is an ugly word. Uh, it could be uh, that there is some profound economic use which is really helpful mm -hmm. and on the other hand it could be something that the uh, commerce, that the uh, final profit takes over all other aspects. Mm -hmm. uh, so it could be both. Um, what I would uh, suggest is to think in terms of a business model. I uh, think in terms of entrepreneurial design mm -hmm. uh, in a way that uh, how can we make usage that is benefiting the cultural heritage and that is benefiting those who take care of that uh, heritage and uh, give the value to the heritage in a way that it is protected because of economic uh, values. But why you, do, why you don't like the term commercialization? Um, <laughs> I usually use it for an economic approach that is not really taking into account the opportunities that are obvious if mm -hmm. we talk about cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. For me commercialization means it's only the economic aspect in, in the way of short-term profits which, uh, cre uh, which turns a beautiful village of workers, of uh, houses into a showroom in town where all these, what the German term Seele mm -hmm. means, that there's a soul in something that you see and you talk to the people and you are at the origin. And then it's taken into a kind of uh, pure, in a negative sense, pure economic uh, uh, venue. And that's poor, that's bad, uh, particularly if there's a cultural uh, uh, line to it and uh, there are people involved and there are, is a village involved, there are children involved and it's about education, it's about ecology of course. Or there are many aspects that you can in a positive way play with and create 
a kind of piece of art. Mm -hmm. So why reduce it to just uh, milking a cow economically? Uh, uh, that's my uh, yeah, critic. Honestly. Do you think that or, instead of using the term commercialization, would there, if we would use the term entrepreneurship, would it be it, better? Yes, to, uh -huh. if you use the term entrepreneurship, it uh, basically uh, comes down to creating a, a good business model. And a business model is the better, the more you involve uh, pillars of, uh, of art, of uh, ecology, of social issues. So it becomes more attractive, it mm. becomes even more beautiful, it mm. becomes more participative. If you reduce it, if you reduce it to economic uh, values only, you reduce. That That's is, right. if you have a piece of art and you only think of it in how much money it would bring in an auction, mm -hmm. uh, it, would, uh, it would be, you lose the art in it. Uh, That's my point. Yeah, I see. It's a very interesting discussion and uh, I find it very important because until now nobody is really aware on that values within and behind uh, uh, that heritage. Do you have an idea how this could be done? I would like to go back to that because I find yeah. it very, very, very important and I've never heard it before in that way. What I would recommend is to uh, pick up some people who have uh, experience in creating business models, successful business uh -huh. models, uh -huh. not just theory, yeah. but those who did work in practice and give them the task to think about that from a business model creation aspect. So I think that would be uh, an interesting experiment and choose people who are familiar that in most problems there is also an ecological aspect and there is an aspect of win-win situation and there is an aspect of how those people who live around uh, cultural heritage can be involved that they protect it and not take away the stones or whatever there is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. available. Mm -hmm. So to try the a procedure of business model creation I think that could be something very helpful. Yeah, that's right. I give you an example. Yeah. I, I have heard about that, but it made sense to me. Uh, there was a professor of archaeology and his task was to excavate something. And uh, he was uh, dissatisfied with his workers. Uh, the workers were well paid, but they were not motivated. They did it as a kind of job. So he tried out and uh, advertised you can participate as a layman, as an amateur, you can participate in the project but I can tell you in advance it's very hard work, it is working under the sunlight and uh, it is most of the time boring because not every time you have something uh, extravagant uh, to find. And he was surprised about the reaction. There was a lot of people who wanted to do it even without payment. Mm -hmm. And he started the experiment and he said it was absolutely great. Those people were highly motivated. And whatever the endeavor and uh, uh, problems of this kind of work was, they still kept being motivated. And they were very fascinated to be part of real uh, research archaeology and uh, uh, it was a very good and successful experiment and they feel uh, grateful that they were mentioned in the final research article uh, that they were part of this research. Mm -hmm. That was their gratification and it worked well. That's great. But does that mean, Günther, that for example entrepreneurship is a holistic concept which include which include uh, not only business on the one hand it is also as we as we discussed uh, uh, from the beginning empowerment participation of course. but what else yeah, of because course. this is an overall of course idea it's of a, you can call it a holistic concept uh, look 
if it's only based on economic uh, considerations, it could easily fall down if somebody undercuts your price or whatever. So it should have another leg as well. And what happens? Will it fall down? No. It has a second uh, pillar to stay on and so with the others. So the more legs your business, the more pillars your uh, business model has, the better. And uh, of course it combines to something that is more stable, uh, has better survival qualities yeah. than a business model that is only based on economic uh, uh, aspects. And if it's profit only, it, nobody becomes excited for anybody else's profit. Mm -hmm. So it must be a little bit more than about profits and about ego of some people. And a good entrepreneurship is when you involve a lot more aspects mm -hmm. than just economics. Yes, it's, you can say it's a holistic concept. But, but the difficulty, uh, you know, uh, this is what I see and this is what I realize, but are you alone when you are managing, for example, your projects as entrepreneur or are you, uh, uh, do you have consultants or, or because you, is, you, you have to have in mind a lot of different and diverse ideas and people and, and, and strategies, so how you find a common understanding and a common strategy? My experience is the more diverse the group, the better the solutions. Uh, even I would uh, put uh, the most diverse people together, a Buddhist monk and somebody who is about medicine and somebody who is about archaeology or whatever. Of course it needs moderation and it needs an understanding that they all work on creating a good business model. I actually, I don't like the term business model because it looks like <laughs> that it's about business only. Mm -hmm. And a model is something of a theory. It should work in practice, not just be a model. That's why I prefer the term entrepreneurial design. It's mm -hmm. about entrepreneurship and it's about design. And design is closer to art and closer to practice than uh, um, a model only. But whatever the term, Uh, it absolutely makes sense to involve people of very different fields mm -hmm. and give them a task to create a, what you call holistic uh, model. But considering the, 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 the level of the level of education we have today in our universities, you know, if we think about Bologna and uh, uh, or we have think about the education in, 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 in secondary schools, where do you find these people? Normally they, they look like that, they have their, uh, their discipline and that's it. They yeah. are not really able to be so creative. I wouldn't be so pessimistic. 20 years ago, yes, the entrepreneurship was a strange field and was an outside kind of uh, business. Nowadays there are a lot of people who understand that you have to create a good entrepreneurial design as a basics to start. So you can find people who have done uh, good design uh, and have put it into practice uh, successfully. So um, it is not that uh, you are an outsider anymore if you propose uh, creating a good entrepreneurial design. Not uh, anymore. It's this even a kind of mainstream now. Startups really? are now uh, Uh, sprouting up everywhere and all the big companies or universities want to have a, a center for startups and uh -huh. try to advise them and give money. So uh, you can put your own idea on top of a lot of initiatives that are there. And there's even a word cultural entrepreneurship. It's a new discipline and it deals with uh, how to uh, make culture available for those people who, for whom it is something strange or who are not, don't have the education or the uh, motivation right now to, to uh, get involved into uh, culture or mm -hmm. even uh, deal with it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that would be an even good point to uh, put culture in a, in a way that it is much more accessible to normal people. Mm -hmm. I was invited to, uh, to the Egyptian Museum with Nofretete as mm -hmm. some of the centerpieces of that exhibition. 
and uh, I have been there for several times. And when I was invited, uh, somebody uh, was celebrating his birthday in the museum, and uh, a professor of Egyptian history uh -huh. was invited. I think he must have been 80 or 90 years, a very old man, a very humble person. And then the light was taken off and he explained or he referred to how Nofretete was excavated in Egypt. The story starts with a, a Berlin merchant mm -hmm. who wanted to sponsor an excavation project and he was sitting together with other people. Actually, actually what I want to say is this professor could uh, tell the story in a way, in the dark, in a way that uh, our fantasy was evoked and we could see the process going on and the search, what site to excavate and so on. And finally the uh, uh, result that they found something in, uh, in the Werkstatt yeah. workshop of a sculpture. Uh -huh. And what I want to say is uh, that somebody tells about it can evoke uh, fantasy is much more intensively than uh, the exhibition uh, pieces uh, can do. So to, to make mm -hmm. the, uh, the story, the history, mm -hmm. uh, make it lively, make mm -hmm. it uh, being presented again. Mm -hmm. And that's just one part, a person who is really involved with his heart, not yeah. only by science, but with his heart, explains the the, the history and uh, it was a, a great experience. We are living in the middle of Fürst Pückler's heritage, so yeah. what can be done? Yeah. I'm an economist, but I was always fascinated from Fürst Pückler and of course I was visiting the park and people are walking around and I was thinking of how can we uh, re-evoke or how can we materialize the spirit that first Pückler, first Pückler has put into this environment, into this creation of the, mm -hmm. this famous Barnitz Park. And uh, I was just uh, using my methods of entrepreneurship and for example uh, make the people participate and I was thinking of three centers in the park. and. Uh, I have to first say, uh, to evoke fantasy, you better do it at night. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea is the performance is done at night in a participative way. Instead of a normal ticket made from paper, visitors get a torch, a torchlight. So you have uh, nighttime and these torchlights, fire. And I would think of three centers. One is a big fire. And one is something uh, where you get something to eat, and another one is music. Mm -hmm. And people uh, have the choice between these uh, centers. And in between, there must be some uh, performances that fit with uh, first Pückler. I don't know the English terms, Elfen. Mm -hmm. Uh, these angel-like figures that could dance and uh, the uh, kobolde, kobolds. Yeah. yeah, I will find that so, one. <laughs> um, actually, so it's a kind of performance that uh, can be done by professional artists, but at the same time I would involve the uh, participants that they get into a situation where they are caught, where they are taken like prisoners mm -hmm. and they can choose to play certain parts uh, for uh, taking care of the fire, in being involved in the cooking, being involved in the cultural performances or just being soldiers to, that take care that the park at night is uh, safe mm -hmm or taking care of uh, visitors uh, that uh, do some nonsense or whatever. There must be some psychologists that fit uh, with the situation and uh, it's a, a new situation for most of the visitors that usually mm -hmm. expect that something is performed to yeah. entertain them. Yeah. They are not used, that they are the players, that they themselves are the entertainers. That's right. So, 
the whole thing would be a participative event and it would uh, live or get the soul from nighttime fire music walking in a dark forest and there could be even assaults of course uh, make me how to say makeshift makeup assaults on visitors going in the dark by people who are players uh, and uh, so a lot of ideas come to mind. Mm -hmm. I even talked to one of the uh, descendants of Fürst Pückler uh -huh. and he found it a good idea. But when I took the whole thing to the village, there was a lot of bureaucracy and uh, a very conservative and conventional idea, right. so I finally gave up. So uh -huh. the spirit of Fürst Pückler, yeah. how to make it, uh, how to like an old piece of uh, uh, literature, how to make it uh, lively, how yeah. to make it lebendig yeah. Yeah. Uh, for our time. So mm -hmm. that could be something. And uh, that is a cultural heritage, uh, making economic use as well. Mm -hmm. But you see, the economic use is a very small part. Yeah. Of course, it could be attractive because it's a new innovation. And I think it would. Uh, uh, has a good chance that uh, it has economic value as well, but I wouldn't start with the economic value. I would start with the spirit of the Spückler and how to make it visible mm -hmm. for uh, participants. I wouldn't call them visitors; they are participants. Yeah, Gunther, summarizing what we have discussed, uh, what we have discussed in this uh, interview. You know, entrepreneurship is starting with the idea, starting with the vision, starting with uh, what people have in mind, what people want to achieve, and, you know, at later on the economic interest. Yeah. Is that the main message of... I think of you have described it very well that uh, the economic benefit is a side product. If you put the economic aspect in the center, it destroys a lot. Yeah. That's what I uh, think commercialization is about, mm -hmm. in a negative way mm -hmm. is about. Uh, that the economic aspect uh, 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 threatens all the other aspects and put them down. So if you have a great kind of festival in a park, it certainly has an economic benefit as well. But the point is how to create a new type of festival that uh, puts first Bückler's spirit in the center, mm -hmm. in, on center stage. And everything around, uh, uh, he was something great in ecological ideas. Yes, absolutely. And he did a lot of very modern things. That is mm -hmm. why he still is alive with his ideas. Mm -hmm. So to uh, use it and uh, do something with this spirit, and as a sideline, as a side effect, you will have uh, some money made from that, mm. yes. That's it. Thank you very much. It was really, really interesting. Thank you.